Hi, everyone. I'm Lori Radke. Welcome and Happy New Year. I think we can still say that. We're almost uh, one month into 2022 and looking ahead to brighter and hopefully warmer days soon. As we start the year, we are so grateful for all the people and organizations that have come together to help the IBD community. We truly appreciate the support received from volunteers, donors, organizations, researchers, and healthcare providers throughout 2021. Because of you, we were able to sustain important research work and award eight new research grants. And because of you, we can continue delivering programs like these webinars. And we're looking ahead with hope. Yesterday was Let's Talk Day, uh, a day to raise awareness for mental health and the importance of talking and supporting each other and ourselves. We know that people affected by IBD often face mental health challenges. It's an important day for us and something we need to think about every day of the year. Please know that there's a community of support available every step of the way, whether it's peer support, education events, content, and more. We hope you're able to lean on these resources. And we've included the QR code here to make it easy for you to access that section of our website. We're also proud to launch our 2022 IBD scholarship program that provides financial support to post-secondary students living with IBD. This year, we will have 15 scholarships to award. Please visit crohnsandcolitis.ca to find out more about programs available to you. As CEO, I have the honor of supporting a promise that started in 1974, that we would find the cures for these devastating diseases and improve lives. And together, we've made many advances towards this goal. And we've recently begun a strategic planning process to set a direction for the future that is informed by our stakeholders. And your input is very important. Thank you to everyone who responded to our strategic planning survey, which will help inform our future direction. We are really at an exciting time for the organization, building on our history, learning from each other, and looking ahead to the future. We look forward to updating you on our strategic renewal later this spring. And building on this, we've also launched a patient needs survey this week, focused on finding out more from those affected by IBD. If you live with Crohn's or colitis or are a caregiver to someone who does, we hope you will complete this survey to help inform our program roadmap. And again, we've provided the QR code to make it easy. Tonight is our 29th webinar, and we will continue to host these webinars as long as you need us to. As always, this information and the webinar recordings can be accessed on our website at crohnsandcolitis.ca. With that, a huge thanks also to our task force, who continues to meet to discuss policies and recommendations necessary for our community. Thank you to today's panelists, Dr. Abdu Sharkawi, for what will be another very interesting discussion on vaccines. Thank you also to BG Communications and Mike the Interpreter for providing live French language interpretation. And of course, much appreciation to our fantastic moderators, Dr. Gil Kaplan, Professor of Medicine at the University of Calgary, Adult Gastroenterologist and Epidemiologist, and past Chair of the Scientific Medical Advisory Council, as well as Dr. Eric Benchamal, Professor and Pediatric Gastroenterologist at the Hospital for Sick Children and University of Toronto, and the Chair of the Scientific Medical Advisory Council, as well as a Crohn's and Colitis Canada board member. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you, Laurie. And since he turned his camera on, I think it's important to introduce uh, Dr. Sharkawi, who many of you have seen on a previous webinar and probably on the news. Uh, Abdu actually has agreed to join the Crohn's and Colitis Task Force to add some infectious disease expertise to the task force. Uh, as you may know, Dr. Sharkawi is an assistant professor of medicine at University of Toronto and an ID specialist, infectious disease specialist at uh, University Health Network. Uh, with expertise in HIV, in drug resistant organisms, and many other aspects of infectious diseases. But I would say an absolute master communicator when it comes to all things COVID. And as a way of explaining the information 
so clearly and so understandably for everyone that we felt it was really important that he come on this month to try to kind of uh, digest, no pun intended, us being gastroenterologists, but digest all of the new information that's come out. It's been two months since our last webinar. So a lot of things have changed. Welcome, Abdu. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for having me. I guess it's important not only to digest, but absorb uh, the information. So I'll, I'll steal that from you. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, obviously, we'd rather be talking about something non COVID related at this point. Um, that being said, I think this is an opportunity for uh, better education across our entire patient community. Um, and if we can do something to serve that and use uh, the, this fifth wave as an unfortunate uh, trigger point for, for uh, allowing that to, to happen, so be it. And I'm happy to be a part of it. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for joining our team. Um, I know we and the whole IBD community really appreciate your expertise. And, and, and this webinar today is a, is a special webinar. As Eric mentioned, we haven't been on for two months. The last webinar we did was very focused on children. And since then, we've had a tremendous number of questions ranging from Omicron, third doses, fourth doses, what happens if I get COVID. Um, and so really what we've decided to do is to really focus in on the questions you've been asking um, CCC. Um, so I've got kind of a presentation that I'm going to delve into some of the questions that have been asked, Eric's uh, likewise, and then we're going to bring Abdu in for kind of a Q&A, and all three of us are going to try to tackle as many questions as we can that you have today. And I'm particularly excited, Gil, because you're going to be presenting some data that has never been presented anywhere. This is sort of the first release of some new, very important data in IBD on immunity and vaccines. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, and with that note, maybe I should, um, I'll just share the screen here. Um, maybe just one second to... Okay, so hopefully everyone can see um, the, the screen. And, um, you know, I actually shared this slide on September 9th, uh, 2021. I presented it during the webinar that we had um, there. Abby was actually a guest a panelist in, in that webinar as well. Um, and it shows the three prior waves of the pandemic in the beginning of the fourth wave that was driven by the Delta variant back in September. Uh, the figure shows us the daily number of cases of COVID diagnosed since March of 2020 in Canada. Now, as everyone knows, we're currently in the largest wave of the pandemic, driven by the highly infectious Omicron wave. And I show you this slide to give you perspective on the next slide, which shows us where we are today in Canada uh, in the fifth wave of uh, the Omicron. So the red line represents 10,000 cases of COVID diagnosed in a single day in Canada, which was the limit of the previous graph I showed you. Prior to Omicron wave, we've never experienced a day in Canada that exceeded 10,000 cases a day. The Omicron wave peaked at nearly about 50,000 cases in one day. Uh, and while the diagnosis of COVID-19 are on the decline in Canada, I wanna temper this decline with two important facts. First, even with the rapid decline, the cases per day is still higher than the peak of any preceding wave of the pandemic. And second, many jurisdictions have dramatically curtailed testing, meaning that the true number of cases of COVID in the population are far higher than what is reported. Consequently, the reported 360 million cases of COVID reported in the world and nearly 3 million reported in Canada as of yesterday is likely only a fraction of the true spread of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in society. So as we watch the fifth Omicron wave unfold, a question on all our minds is when is this going to stop? Is COVID here forever? Um, will SARS-CoV-2 become endemic in society, meaning they'll continue to circulate in pockets of the global population for years to come? Uh, the choice to not be vaccinated is not just a simple choice of personal protection for yourself, but it's one that has dire consequences on a society uh, as whole. The choices are fundamental in answering the question if we can achieve herd immunity in society. Um, and I just want to highlight five key factors that affect uh, herd immunity. Um, the first factor is whether vaccines can prevent transmission. Um, and if we compare what I talked about in September to today, we're starting to realize that vaccines are highly effective at preventing severe COVID-19, but we are seeing breakthrough infections among those who are fully vaccinated, including the third dose of the vaccine. Consequently, the Swiss cheese model is still relevant today as no single intervention is perfect at preventing the spread of infection. The second factor is the rise of variants like Omicron. 
Uh, this figure demonstrates the Delta variant outcompeted other versions of the, of the virus back in the summer and the fall, but then Omicron variant crushed Delta, mainly because it's just far more infectious. Uh, new variants of SARS-CoV-2, such as Omicron, are sprouting up, and they might even be more transmissible and potentially resistant to vaccines, and that's going to require potentially the generation of new mRNA vaccines that target specific variants to, to the virus. And of course, we all recognize that COVID-19 is a global disease and it requires a global strategy for vaccination. The longer it takes to stem the transmission of the virus, the more time these variants have to emerge and to spread. Uh, and lagging vaccine programs can lead to selective evolutionary process that favor the formation of these new variants. Um, and today we still see disparity in distribution of vaccines um, between countries and also within countries. Uh, and of course, if you look at the map here, we can even see in Africa, we still see very low penetrance of vaccination. Um, and really the big emphasis is to vaccinate the world um, equally. Um, as vaccine penetration in society increases, people are reverting to pre-pandemic behavior and governments are starting to lift public health mandates like masking, we're seeing that in regions throughout the world. Um, but if these actions are taken too quickly before we can get people fully vaccinated, and I think fully vaccinated means three doses now, as it was two doses in the past, uh, it's going to be very difficult for us to achieve uh, herd immunity. Uh, and finally, we know that immunity does not last forever. Third doses are necessary. We need to understand how long vaccine-based immunity lasts. We also need to understand if some individuals are at higher risk of their antibodies waning over time. This is a graph from the IBD Clarity study in the UK that shows us antibody levels decay after two doses of the vaccine, and that this decay was different based on the types of treatments. People who had IBD who were on infliximab had greater decay than those who were on betaluzumab. And I just want to share with you some recent data from IBD Clarity that's been published in the last couple of months that shows the importance of antibody levels in those with IBD who are immunocompromised by their treatments. So think of your antibodies like water in a sink. Exposure to the virus or getting a vaccine adds to that pool of water. However, over time, the pool of protection just naturally decreases. So then we get a booster shot or a third dose to increase our level of protection again, even higher than with just our first shot. Over time, this level of protection will naturally start to fall again. But what does that mean for your risk? Well, your risk of contracting COVID is never zero but vaccines keep your risk as low as possible. As your antibody levels increase, your risk of contracting COVID decreases. And in a recent study from IBD Clarity, the amount of that decreased risk was correlated with increasing antibodies, such that, a, uh, such that for each tenfold increase in antibodies, there was a 0.8 fold decrease in the risk of a breakthrough infection. That is an infection that occurs despite a person being vaccinated already. Now, what happens to antibody levels after two doses of vaccine in those with IBD? So today I wanna to share with you data generated by my team at the University of Calgary. And we presented it um, last Friday at the Crohn's and Colitis Congress meeting that was held virtually. Um, our team has recruited over 500 individuals with IBD and we've been serially measuring their antibody levels to the spike protein after each dose of the vaccine. And what we're trying to do is understand the rise in antibody levels after each vaccine and whether antibody levels decay over time. We're also trying to explore what factors influence antibody levels like age and drugs to treat IBD. Now this figure shows antibody levels across three groups. First dose of the vaccine, one to eight weeks following the second dose of the vaccine, and more than eight weeks following the second dose. The blue line represents the threshold or antibody levels are positive, a value of 50 units um, for the assay that we use. Antibody levels vary widely from a value as low as 10 to as high as over 10,000. So the y-axis is fitted to account for this variability. The bottom portion of the figure shows low antibody levels, whereas the top shows very high antibody levels. So what do we see? Overall, 82% of IBD patients seroconverted, meaning that they mounted antibody levels above that threshold of 50. The average antibody levels were about 1,800 units, and this was after the first dose of the vaccine. Now, what happens after the second dose of the vaccine? Well, if we look at with antibodies within one to eight weeks of the second dose of the vaccine, 99% of IBD patients mounted an antibody response with the average antibody levels climbing to over 9,200 units. Now, if we go past that eight week 
10 weeks past the second dose, 12 weeks, 16 weeks, and so on, we start to see antibodies wane with nearly 4% having lost their seroconversion uh, and the average antibody level falling to around 2,800. Falling antibody levels are highlighted in this graph that shows time from the second dose of the vaccine. In our models that also account for factors like age, prior COVID infections, treatments people are on, we calculated that the antibody fall is roughly about 10% or 400 units per week after two months of the second dose of the vaccine. While we don't fully understand what level of antibodies are necessary for full protection, the data from IBD Clarity that I showed you previously suggests as antibodies fall, the risk of a breakthrough infection rises. So what can we do to address the decay of antibodies after two doses of the vaccine in those who have IBD? Well, we can get a third dose. And I wanna share with you data on 200 individuals with IBD who we tested their antibody levels after the third dose of one of the COVID-19 vaccines. After the third dose, 99.5%, essentially all but one person, seroconverted. And the average antibody levels climbed dramatically from 2,800 on average, when we looked at kind of over eight weeks after the second dose to over 14,000 units after the third dose of the vaccine. And these are very, very high antibody levels. This figure shows antibody levels in those with the second, do second dose of the vaccine denoted by the red dots versus individuals with IBD whose antibody levels were measured after the third dose in roughly the same uh, time period. Now, in Alberta, IBD patients were eligible for the third dose of the vaccine in August, most of them getting it in September, October. But many of the IBD patients didn't get their third shot in the fall of 2021. And so then we can kind of compare what happens to antibody levels in people who got their third dose versus those who didn't get their second dose, or sorry, those people who didn't get their third dose but had two doses earlier in the year. And we can see from this figure that those who did not receive their third shot had a clear separation in antibody levels both because their antibody levels decayed over time, but also because the third dose led to such a dramatic rise in antibody levels. Now, our limited data on time from third dose of the vaccine suggests that antibodies will decay after the third dose. Um, our model suggests it's roughly about 10 to 15% per, per, per week, um, but we still have very limited data to be able to look at that in a more precise way. Um, but the key thing is that even if antibody levels are decaying from the third dose, they're starting from a much, much higher platform uh, than, than what we were seeing with the second dose uh, uh, vaccine antibodies. Um, so we realize that there are a number of factors that may influence antibody levels uh, over time. Uh, I wanna discuss the impact of age, which we've discovered to be a very important factor. Uh, in our prior graphs, I showed you a two-dimensional plot with antibody levels on the y-axis uh, and time from the vaccine dose on the x-axis. This is a three-dimensional plot that adds decade of age um, as well. Uh, these are dots that represent antibody levels over time among individuals with IBD who are over the age of 80 years. The animation shows us how antibody levels rise consistently across young age groups. These dots include Age, those age 70 to 79, and as we can see what happens as we go to 60 to 69, and with each uh, decade um, that follows. But as you can see from this three-dimensional plot, uh, age isn't the only factor that influences antibody levels, and some younger individuals have lower antibodies. So we're trying to explore some of these other factors, and one of the obvious things for us to look at was the impact of drugs, um, drugs that people have used to treat their inflammatory bowel disease. So it's a bit of a, bu a busy figure. Um, it shows um, average antibody levels after the first dose, after the second dose within the first eight weeks, after the second dose, um, after eight weeks, uh, and then of course antibodies after the third dose. And each line represents a different drug that, that people were on. Uh, so for example, um, you can see that there were people in the blue line was on uh, Stellarus to Kinemab alone. The yellow line was uh, Intivio or Vitaluzumab alone. Um, and the figure shows us what happens to average antibody levels across different treatments groups of IBD. Um, we can see across most drug classes a large jump in antibody levels within one to eight weeks after the second dose of the vaccine. But after eight weeks from the second dose, antibody levels decay. 
However, across the board, we see a large rise in antibody levels after the third dose. The impact of the third dose was consistent across Stelera, Intivio, the anti-TNF therapies, including Remicade and Humira and their biosimilars. Um, it also was seen in individuals who are not on treatment, people who are on 5-ASA therapies like Mesovant, uh, and also individuals who are on combination of immunosuppressive therapies. So they might have been on an anti-TNF and an immunomodulator, or they might have been on two biologics like Intivio uh, and Remicade. Um, the, so these were all shown that antibody levels, that third dose basically essentially increased antibodies right across all the drugs. The only IBD medication that did not mount high antibodies across each dose level are those IBD patients who were flaring and requiring oral prednisone to treat their active inflammatory bowel disease. And this data emphasizes the importance of getting your third shot now while you're well controlled on your medications. So should IBD patients receive a fourth dose of the vaccine? And if so, when? Uh, the answer to this question is largely unknown. There's essentially no, no data on this, or very, very, very little data, uh, even outside of the IBD population. Um, and it highlights the limitation of the data I've just presented to you. We don't know how fast antibodies will decay after the third dose. And even if they do fall, uh, other parts of the immune system like memory T cells may effectively treat the infection. Uh, and if antibodies stay high over time, we're not sure if they're gonna be specific to variants like Omicron or potentially even new ones that may emerge in the future. And of course, personal factors beyond drug treatments, including your age, whether you've had a prior infection, may also influence things as well. And the other thing that's very important too is what is your risk of being exposed to COVID in the city and where you are um, and what you do and work and, and so on like that. And for these reasons, a lot more research uh, is ongoing in those with, with IBD. Now, um, before I call on Eric to discuss uh, CC's recommendations um, that we've, we've made over the past uh, few months, I just wanna acknowledge uh, my team at the University of Calgary who were instrumental in generating um, the data that I presented today. Um, Nasser and Michelle and Ante, you can see from their photos here, have tirelessly recruited and coordinated the study over the past 18 months. Uh, Josh Kwan is a master's student who's crunched all the data. Um, Stephanie is our IBD uh, epidemiologist, PhD epidemiologist in our unit who's uh, mentored Josh through this process. Uh, Lindsay's a postdoc in our lab that's creating all of our 3D models. She's also developing data visualization tools that we're going to share with you in future webinars um, ab about our study. Um, Leah's exploring our questionnaire data that we have with our, with our study. Uh, and both Michael and Josh are working on a systematic review that are going to compare our data in Canada to other uh, vaccine antibody cohorts that are, are being done throughout the world. Uh, and finally, Joey, who's our knowledge translation manager, prepared every slide that you saw today because I had a really busy clinical week with Omicron and GI. Um, so I really appreciate him putting these fancy slides together. Uh, and lastly, I just wanna thank um, every participant in this study. Um, the, um, every dot that you saw was a person with IBD who had volunteered their time to give a blood sample um, during a pandemic. And I truly appreciate that. And with that, I'm just gonna ask uh, Eric to come and join me. And Great, look. thank you, Gil. That was fantastic, uh, amazing stuff. I think there was a question very briefly about why no data for third dose on Zeljans. Uh, yeah, so it, I assume numbers. It, it, yeah, it's, it's numbers. We don't have a lot of patients um, on Zeljans just in general in, in our IBD population. It's a drug limited to ulcerative colitis, tends to be kind of a later line, a later line drug. Um, that's that systematic review I was telling you about. Our goal is to combine our data with other studies to increase numbers on drugs that we have low samples like Zeljans. Perfect. Thanks. All right. So I am tasked, uh, pun intended to update the activities of the task force over the past couple of months for you so that you can see what's been updated in terms of our recommendations and uh, the website and so on. Um, let's see if I can advance here, there we go. So uh, when last we met at around November, 2021, the impact of COVID-19 and IBD in Canada report, which had been released on the website, on the Crohn's and Colitis Canada website in June, uh, was released as a supplemental issue of the Journal of the Canadian Association of Gastroenterology. And that sort of summarized about a year, year and a half of the work of the task force uh, through, through the pandemic. So you can see the full report if you scan there. Um, we held our last webinar on November 25th, and it was really focused on pediatric vaccines because the COVID vaccines were approved for use in children age 5 to 11. 
um, at the time. And so we had some excellent information on pediatric vaccines and I'll update on, on a little bit on that as well in a second. And then a lot of things changed. On December 13th, the Omicron variant of COVID-19 became the predominant COVID-19 strain in Canada the week that week. And on December 14th, we held the task force meeting. And actually when we had planned the task force meeting on December 14th, everything was sort of coming up roses, right? We were able to uh, sort of start to go out again. Things were opening up, schools were opening, the vaccines were working fantastically and our vaccine rates were rising. And we had originally planned a task force meeting in December to start to say, all right, should we start to loosen up our recommendations uh, for patient people, for IBD people who are vaccinated? Uh, and then Omicron hit and we met in December and said, uh, we don't really know what's going to happen here and we probably shouldn't loosen things up, but we did change some things on the website and make some new recommendations. And then we decided to hold a follow-up meeting on January 4th in case something changed with Omicron over the holidays. Um, so this is really what happened. And these are data from Ontario looking at the, the rate of the different strains in Ontario. This is sort of the, the original COVID-19 looking at sort of from March, 2020, right up to April, 2021, when the alpha strain became predominant. And then in about July, the Delta strain started to become the predominant strain. And we know that vaccines work perfectly, work very well, I should say perfectly, but 90% effective at controlling infection and preventing infection for the wild type alpha and delta. And then Omicron hit in sort of early December and very rapidly became the predominant strain in the province of Ontario, but really everywhere uh, overall. Uh, so Omicron we learned was very, very highly contagious. Uh, you know, if left uncontrolled based on numbers in the UK and Denmark, if left uncontrolled, one person with Omicron tended to uh, cause infection in about six or seven people uh, who did not have, who were not infected. And that's compared to two or three for previous strains of COVID-19. Uh, we learned about the importance of a third dose of vaccine uh, because Omicron contained an escape gene or multiple escape genes where the vaccines were not as effective and therefore you needed the boost of immunity. We developed, so there was more and more information or, or recommendations starting in Israel for receiving the fourth dose of the vaccine. And now we'll talk about it in Canada as well. And we had more evidence on vaccine efficacy, effectiveness, and safety in both children and pregnant women, which uh, have all been integrated into our new recommendations. So let's talk about changes to the website and changes to our vaccine recommendations. Uh, we recommended that children five and older should receive a complete series, meaning three doses. So the, the COVID vaccine should now be considered complete only after three doses. That's the evidence that, evidence that we have two doses is not enough. And that was even probably true before Omicron hit, but it's especially true now with Omicron. And we recommended that children five and over should receive a complete series as soon as possible. Uh, so that does mean not necessarily waiting the eight weeks for children with IBD who are immunocompromised or who may become immunocompromised. And it's important to remember that children with IBD are much more likely to be on biologics than adults with IBD. About 70% of our children with Crohn's end up on a biologic. Uh, and probably about 40% with ulcerative colitis end up on a biologic. So we recommended the third dose of the vaccine in children five and up, four to eight weeks after the second dose. And no matter what, regardless of vaccination status, we recommended good uh, physical distancing and good hand hygiene and other uh, public health measures. It doesn't replace uh, being vaccinated, unfortunately, at this time. And this is really why, again, data from the Ontario Science Table, uh, this is looking at vaccine effectiveness with the blue line being against any infection, symptomatic infection, testing positive, so on. The yellow line being against hospitalization and the red line being against ICU admission. So you can see that right up until when Omicron hit, the vaccines were about 80 to 85% effective at preventing infection. And then it dropped off very, very quickly in December and almost became 0% effective at uh, preventing infection. And now it's starting to come back up. And I'll explain a little bit of well, why that drop off happened and perhaps why the coming back up happened in just a second. However, I think it's very important to note that two vaccines remain very, very effective at preventing hospitalization in, in adults. 
uh, and especially at preventing ICU admissions, despite lower effectiveness at preventing infection. So why is this? Why did this happen? Why did this lower effectiveness of preventing infection happen? So firstly, we know that Omicron has genes in the spike protein that allow it to escape both vaccine immunity, vaccine-induced immunity, and natural immunity if you were infected to Delta or previous strains of COVID-19. So that's one and probably the main reason. But I think that there's a second reason that we have forgotten and hasn't been covered very well in the media. And I want to remind you because we presented this information back in December 2020 when the vaccines first started to be approved. And that's this concept of a vaccine as a fire hose. And it was really made popular, not by us, obviously, but by the New York Times. But let, let me remind you what that means. So if you pretend the vaccine is a fire hose held by this happy firefighter uh, and the firefighter comes to put out a campfire, you know, a little self-contained campfire, small outbreak of COVID-19 amongst a few people, clearly the vaccine is going to put out that campfire. If you've got a group of vaccinated people around the campfire, it's going to put out that campfire. The people with the infection, it'll, they'll get better. And the people around them will not get infected. And that's the campfire is considered an R naught of less than one, meaning one person with the infection will infect fewer than one person uh, after that. What about a house fire? A house fire is like having an R value of one to two, meaning one person with the infection also infects one or two other people. And the vaccines were high, and that's really the, you know, the Delta variant and before that, the Alpha variant, that really is what we were dealing with. And in fact, the firefighter can do a very good job at even putting out the house fire. We found it was 80%, 85% effective at putting out the house fire and preventing further infections. But back in December, 2020, I, I sort of talked about this, that a, a single firefighter with a fire hose is not gonna put out a forest fire. And the forest fire is sort of an R value of more than two. So every person who's infected infects more than two people beyond that. And that's sort of now a bit funny because Omicron, we're talking about an R value of six or seven. So it's like the entire Western seaboard on fire. We can't expect the vaccines to be able to hold that in check. So the only way that we're going to hold that in check is by uh, in enabling other public health measures, as Gil was mentioning earlier, that Swiss cheese model, masking and distancing and not getting together in large groups and all of the other things that you know, public health has recommended implementing over the past month or so. Uh, happy or sad, you know, in order to prevent this forest fire from spread, fire from spreading, we need to do these things. So, but I think it's not all bad news now. And I think this is really important. This is as of today from the Ontario science table. Again, this is Ontario numbers, but I think it would apply to every province. We can see that once again, the vaccine is very effective. It's about 60% effective at preventing infection. So although people are saying, you know, vaccine, vaccines no longer work at preventing infection, that isn't true anymore. We now know that now that we've gotten Omicron, we seem to be getting Omicron under some control the number of infections are going down, vaccines seem to be working, and also third dose, right? Now that, you know, about, I think it's about 40, 50% of the population in Canada have the third dose, and we know the third dose is effective at preventing Omicron spread. Uh, it is doing quite well at preventing infection. But more importantly, being vaccinated with two doses, at least two doses, meaning two or three, uh, prevents highly preventative for hospitalization, so severe COVID and ICU admission, and of course, death. So even if you have two doses, we are absolutely recommending a third because you're not fully protected, but two doses and three doses are highly protective with Omicron at preventing bad COVID, which is great news. Looking at this another way, uh, these are the number of cases in unvaccinated versus vaccinated. You can see that here vaccine effectiveness was almost zero. Yeah, we had the same number of cases in vaccinated and unvaccinated people, but now there's that spread being seen between vaccinated and unvaccinated once again, which is good news for people who are vaccinated. Similarly for hospitalization, while that well, rate of hospitalization went up in vaccinated people, it's not nearly at the rate when you look at per million people who are vaccinated versus per million people who are unvaccinated, there's a massive spread there, meaning that the vaccines are still highly, highly effective 
at preventing hospitalization. And similarly, ICU admission, very highly effective. So now let's move on to other stuff that we need to do. So we've recommended the third vaccine dose. What else do we need to do to prevent COVID from spreading? Um, as we mentioned, Omicron is highly contagious and may travel further than two meters. I think it's very well accepted now that uh, COVID-19 is airborne and particularly Omicron is airborne. So the whole thing about two meters of, and six feet were really, was really about droplet uh, spread. So actually spreading droplets, the virus in saliva uh, or mucus in the air and spreading it to other people. And droplets fall quickly, but airborne spread means they can hang in the air. You know, they may be in small droplets or aerosolized droplets, but they can hang in the air for much, much longer and travel much further distances. So this whole idea of two meters or six feet indoors is probably not accurate anymore. And this idea of outdoors being safer means that ventilation is super important, right? So ventilation meaning that there's air dispersing the particles and making them fall to the ground. And that's why HEPA filters work. That's why distancing further works. And that's why there's not spread outdoors for the most part. So we now must use both vaccines and high quality masks to prevent infection. And so one of the changes to the, our recommendation was the implement, implementation of high quality masks, meaning KN95 or N95 masks that are certified to prevent 95% of five micrometer molecules or smaller from exiting the mask. If that's not available, we know that they're expensive and very difficult to come by right now uh, for the general public, public, unfortunately. A lot of places are sold out. If that's not available and you must, then three or four ply surgical masks are okay, but do not use cloth masks anymore. Unfortunately, those really are not effective at preventing COVID-19 spread in the age of Omicron. So what about children, teens, and back to school? Again, we recommend that the children and teens use a KN95 or an N95 mask, and that goes for teachers as well. Uh, we've kind of removed these recommendations about disinfecting your house. That was from way back in March of 2020, when we thought that COVID could live on hard surfaces, on what we call fomite uh, or inanimate objects. It still can, but that doesn't seem to be the predominant way of spread of COVID-19. So really this idea of disinfecting your house it's not nearly as important as masks and vaccines. And what we now know, and what we said, we said about a month ago, Coronavirus Canada, that the, the benefits of vaccines for children far, far outweigh the risks. Uh, and we recommended the second vaccine, instead of waiting eight weeks, as the original uh, NACI recommendations and many of the provinces are recommending waiting eight weeks for the second dose in children, if a child is immunosuppressed, we recommend the second dose four weeks after the first because the benefits of that vaccine preventing Omicron spread outweigh the risks to the child. And that's very important. Most provinces will allow you to give your child the second dose earlier before eight weeks with informed consent. So you go to the pharmacy and you say, I want my child to get it early. You will be able to get it. And then we are now recommending the third vaccine dose for children about four to eight weeks after the second dose. And I'm sure we'll talk about this a little bit later in the Q&A. And you know, not surprisingly, as of two days ago, NACI, the National Advisory Committee on Immunizations caught up with this recommendation and they made two changes to their pediatric recommendations. The first is that they now strongly recommend, uh, and this is different than it was originally. Originally, it was that they suggested and that it should be offered. Now it is that they strongly recommend uh, a complete series of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, uh, the lower dose for children aged five to 11 space. They're still recommending eight weeks apart, but we are recommending four to eight weeks apart. And then if you look down at their immunocompromised recommendations, they're, they're, they're starting to say four to eight weeks apart now as well. In addition, they recommend for the immunocompromised uh, population that a third dose be given four to eight weeks after the second dose. And then they define what immunocompromised is, and that essentially include the list that they give essentially includes any medication for IBD. So that's steroids, it's azathioprine or imuran, methotrexate, all the biologics like Remicade uh, and the biosimilars for infliximab, Humira and the biosimilars, Stelara, uh, Vitalizumab, Intivio, and uh, Zelgens, Tofacitinib. 
And they actually also recommend for patients on five ASA medications like Astacol, Mesavant, and so on. Uh, those patients also qualify for a third dose, probably because they're at risk for needing immunosuppression at some point in the future anyway. Pregnant women with IBD, again, I think the, the evidence over the past two months has evolved to the point where we know that it's highly effective in pregnant women, and pregnant women are at huge risk for complications and pregnancy loss, unfortunately, due to COVID-19 infection. So we are recommending three doses uh, for pregnant women with IBD using masks and being very, very cautious with masks when you're indoors with other people. And for newborns, uh, after the pregnant women have given birth, avoiding indoor spaces with people who are outside your home. Uh, COVID-19 vaccines in pregnancy seem to protect the newborn from infection and physical distancing of two meters or more when outdoors with the newborn is also recommended. And then the new recommendation as of uh, yesterday, I guess, that the COVID-19 task force decided upon was this fourth dose. And, and the bottom line is that there's very limited evidence for a fourth dose right now. Uh, there is, as far as I'm aware, and maybe Dr. Shakao, we can update us if he's aware of any additional studies afterwards. But uh, as far as I'm aware, there's one unpublished study uh, from Israel that reported a five times increased antibody rate in 155 healthy healthcare workers who received a fourth dose of COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, we don't know anything about whether that actually protected against infection. And we also don't know whether immunocompromised people would mount that type of antibody response after a fourth dose as well. And then finally, we don't know uh, what the best timing for the fourth dose is. Some people are saying three months, some people are saying six months, none of those data are available yet. So with all of this lack of uh, information, lack of evidence, Despite this, some provinces are saying that immunocompromised people can get a fourth dose three to six months after their third dose. And what we are saying, and it's a bit of a, a, a mouthful, I guess, but what we're saying is, although that the data are limited, Crohn's and Colitis Canada supports the idea of a fourth dose for of COVID-19 vaccine for individuals with IBD who are immunocompromised by their meds, given the potential benefit and the really low risk of harm because the risk in COVID-19 vaccines is very, very low. And perhaps it will help you with mounting more antibodies. This is especially important in regions with high transmission of the virus, very high rates of the virus. And then we said that while studies establishing the ideal time is are pending, we don't have that information. We'll stick with what the provinces are recommending about three to six months between the third and fourth doses. But don't drop the public health precautions. Don't drop mask mandates. Uh, let us get more data on the effectiveness of the fourth dose. And obviously, as you know now, you probably have heard that Pfizer and Moderna are, have started trials on a dose of the vaccine specific for Omicron. Uh, and so we'll have to see, you know, at that point when it's approved, if it's approved, uh, whether that should be your fourth dose or not, or fifth dose potentially. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and I will call back. Gil and Abdu to start going into the Q&A part of our program. So Abdu, I, I, let's start by just asking if you have any other, uh, anything else to add on what we've said so far with both the recommendations from Crohn's and Colitis Canada, maybe re especially regarding the fourth dose and anything about the antibodies that, that Gil presented. No, I think uh, both yourself and Gil did such a fantastic job. I almost feel redundant right now, um, but uh, I, I agree. I think that um, much of what is out there regarding fourth dosing is related to simply that Israeli study. I'm not aware of any studies published or unpublished otherwise that speak to this. Um, and I think there are just a ton of factors that are gonna play into A, whether that uh, fourth dose is necessary, B, how soon it's going to be necessary and C, how broadly applicable it's going to be uh, based on uh, the degree of circulating uh, transmission of, of Omicron um, and who's getting infected still. So there's a lot that yet uh, remains to be determined, uh, but I really like the fact that you emphasize the importance of the other public health measures. I, I, I know it's not as uh, sexy and as, uh, you know, uh, gratifying with with as much uh, readable exactitude, if you will, uh, as a vaccine, but it, it's important. And the the all hands on deck approach, 
um, you know, the multiple weapons in your arsenal or the multiple shields is really the way to win uh, against not just Omicron, but, but against the entire pandemic. And I think we have to really retool ourselves and reformulate our, our uh, efforts towards making that the way we, we go forward. Um, we're not going to out-vaccinate uh, ourselves against this, this virus. Um, and it's, it's been a painful lesson now five waves in and three of those waves having been, um, you know, experienced during the vaccine era. Thank you. If I could, um, ask you like the, the very first graph I show that, um, which is the different waves in Canada, like we, we've been, I've been showing that with every, essentially every webinar that I've had dating back to the very first webinar. And, and I have this uh, amazing team of epidemiologists and uh, slide generating gurus on my team. And so when they showed me what this updated version was with the fifth wave just completely dwarfing all the other ones, making the other waves look like they were just little baby like humps, um, I was just shocked. And I just was curious, just give the audience a pers perspective of why this wave is so different. And, and, and I guess even a bit of a, a deeper dive into how this wave is impacting the hospitals and the healthcare system um, as compared to previous waves? For sure. And, you know, um, you, know uh, you mentioned early on um, that I'm interested in, in drug resistance and in antimicrobial resistance. And, you know, the interplay of us as, as uh, humans, uh, hosts to bugs, bacteria, viruses, et cetera, and the balance that our immune system and the way that we respond to it is a, it's a fascinating dynamic. It's also a very scary one. And, you know, when we think about drug resistant organisms, whether we're talking about um, certain antibiotics, for example, or viruses that become resistant to the therapies, it really is a war. I hate to use military analogies, but, you know, we try and retool ourselves. We come up with bigger weapons and, you know, the, the bugs go back to their uh, own bunker and they come up with different strategies to make themselves more camouflage, difficult to recognize. Uh, they come up with, with uh, little antics, if you will, to try and perturb us, annoy us, and sometimes outright defeat us very cleverly. It's really no different with, with this virus. W what has changed here is number one, the scale at which it has occurred and the rapidity with which it has spread across the world and the fact that it's so dynamic and the fact that we see when we up our game um, and if we don't do it the right way, the virus will find footholds. Unfortunately, that has been in under-resourced populations. You mentioned that graph, which was just so vivid of, of almost the entire continent of Africa, much of the Indian subcontinent, parts of Eastern Europe and, and Asia that, that are really, they're dying literally and figuratively for vaccine coverage, and they're not getting it. Uh, it's no coincidence that um, the Delta variant came out of India, which, which ironically was mass producing vaccines and exporting them uh, here and to other parts of the world while uh, their own citizens weren't receiving the vaccines that they probably needed to, to protect them. That's what spawned the, the Delta wave. Uh, the Omicron wave, we can argue about whether it happened exactly in South Africa or, or not, and if it spread to other parts before or after. Uh, the reality is, is probably the same phenomenon, is that you know unless we really go about trying to find that forest fire and find where those embers are going to start burning, then we're all on fire. It's a question of, of, of what the time is. You know, uh, we're looking at this pandemic to end and where, where things are going to really improve, not when things slow down in Montreal and Manhattan, it's when they slow down in Malawi and Mozambique and, you know, places like that. And, and we call it a global pandemic. It's not a euphemism. It's the reality. So I think we really have to wrap our heads around that or we're in for a really protracted pandemic, unfortunately, that, that's not going to be easy to tolerate for, for anyone. Um, you know, in terms of what's happened in, with respect to hospitalizations and, and the new face of, of COVID, it's quite fascinating. On the one hand, we've seen some tremendous um, progress with respect to live saved people who have been salvaged, who have done much better than I could have ever imagined uh, had they presented in the third wave. I think much of that is due, number one, to the fact that we have a great deal more body of experience, not only with steroids, using dexamethasone early and upfront, 
but also these secondary therapies that go along with it, uh, monoclonal antibodies in particular, and some of these other new Janus kinase inhibitors that have been used for rheumatoid arth arthritis, for example, like baricitinib. And when we employ them in a thoughtful way and time them uh, appropriately, it's amazing and it's dramatic in terms of the, the, the recovery that you see from someone who literally looks like they are gasping for life. Uh, they're on the precipice of either needing mechanical ventilation, ending up in an ICU, multi-organ failure to literally being redeemed. Not back to normal, but certainly taken out of the, you know, the, the well of, of the fire within a fairly short period of time. And I, I just came off the COVID ward this past week and it was unbelievable. I saw this in one of my young patients. And that's something that I think is incredibly um, rewarding. It, it gives us some hope that at least we're going to save people from dying. On, on the other hand, the morbidity is something that has not changed. And in fact, it's something we have to be very careful about dismissing. Um, we have a fair amount of evidence that suggests that with greater degrees of immunity from, from second and third dose vaccines, the likelihood of what we call long COVID or COVID long haul seems to diminish quite proportionately, which is great news. Um, we, we don't know, we don't have enough evidence with Omicron because it just sort of arrived yesterday, if you will, to say if that's going to be the same thing. We hope so. But are we willing to take that chance? Are we willing to allow ourselves to become exposed, to become infected, even though we might survive, we may not need the ICU, even if we are admitted to hospital, knowing that that risk still exists? And I would argue that's probably not something we want to do, especially in children, where there is mounting evidence that there have been subtle changes with respect to cognitive impairment, uh, neurologic effects, et cetera, that may have lasting impact with respect to their learning and a whole host of other things. We have to remember this is such a strange virus in terms of immune dysregulation, in terms of how it affects our blood vessels. We have not seen this with any virus, respiratory or otherwise, until now. So my advice is let's not invite it. Let's not get in the way of it and say, ah, I'm glad I got it over with. That's the wrong uh, attitude, I think, if, if we can avoid it in the first place and prevent transmission. The people I'm seeing in the hospital, unfortunately, we're still seeing the people that were at risk in the first wave. We're seeing the resurgence of long-term care outbreaks. So we're seeing those uh, under-vaccinated, double-vaccinated uh, nursing home residents who, who are very, very sick, uh, ending up in the ICU. They're dying disproportionately. Um, of the younger patients, it is disproportionately, again, and overwhelmingly, those that are not vaccinated, those are the ones that are getting very, very sick. The air hunger, the ones we're throwing the kitchen sink at with monoclonal antibodies and steroids and saying, I need to call the ICU soon and, and get them, uh, get this patient on their radar. They look very, very sick. And I think that's an important picture to, to, to uh, retain because much as we'd like to think of this virus, uh, Omicron, especially as being maybe more mild, we have to remember it spreads so much more quickly. And the fact is at some point, you know, you may hit that statistical dial where you shouldn't. The patients that I've had who are young, who've been very sick this past week are completely healthy. They have no underlying health conditions. And that's not just documented, that's after us going through a fairly fulsome workup and saying, you know, this is a sign of hyperglycemia or hypertension or something else and you've just been undiagnosed. No, they are perfectly healthy. And that should give us pause to recognize that you're not scot-free uh, if you're healthy, if you happen to have the right situation for the virus to, to, to get you um, and the right set of circumstances. And unfortunately, you present for medical attention um, late in, in the onset of your, your symptoms. So I think there's a lot to look forward to, but we have to do absolutely everything we can to reduce transmission. That's gonna decrease the burden of infection across our community. It's going to make it easier for our healthcare system to try and recover, uh, for everyone to be able to marshal the resources we need uh, to avoid uh, oncoming waves. And I hate to say it, but I think they're gonna come unless we really tackle this issue of vaccine uh, inequity uh, with more sincerity than we're doing right now. 
Great, thanks. I think I uh, just want to go back to something that you said, Abdu, about uh, monoclonal antibodies and now sort of the increasing available of Paxlovid, uh, or soon, I guess. Uh, you know, I think even we're getting questions as pediatric gastroenterologists about 16 or 17 year olds that uh, hospitals want to start monoclonal antibodies on them. What's your recommendation in our population of IBD patients and knowing what drugs they're on and so on about using either monoclonal antibodies or Paxlovid? Well, let me start with Paxlovid because I think it's a little bit easier in the sense that truthfully, operationally, I think it's going to be very challenging to use Paxlovid without a very well-oiled, coordinated machine out of hospital with respect to primary care practitioners, um, you know, community anchors, because number one, the, the stipulation right now for a PCR test positivity pr presents a huge barrier. Uh, there's an access problem there, number one. Number two, there's a turnaround time problem. And then you combine that with the fact that the indication is within the first five days of symptom onset, where you really want to hit that viral replication on the nose. And you're looking at a pretty narrow number of people that you're going to be able to target. What I truly feel is going to be the niche for this drug is that it's going to have to pivot. Our recommendations are going to have to pivot to at the very least allow rapid antigen tests to be coupled with a compatible symptom complex. And at that point say, okay, then you can have some sort of protocol where you've got a primary care practitioner or a subspecialist who knows you well, who can communicate uh, and coordinate this quickly, get you the prescription on time and get on it. Because if you don't get it within those five days, the horse is out of the barn. And at that point in time, we're accomplishing nothing. It's the same issue really with remdesivir. It's just that remdesivir is an IV drug, which completely hampers its you know, uh, practicability outside of the hospital setting. Paxlovid is really not much different. Um, the other thing is Paxlovid has a lot of drug-drug interactions. So it may not necessarily mean as much to the typical IBD patient um, who may not have a whole lot of other comorbidities. But, you know, when you talk about the general medical population and you talk about, you know, statins and blood thinners and a whole bunch of other drugs that are used fairly frequently, it may become a bit problematic. So as much as I love the idea of another tool in our tool shed, I'm going to throw a little bit of cold water on Paxlovid because I think it's going to be a little narrower in terms of its uh, scale of uh, application. With respect to monoclonal antibodies, you know, experientially, it seems that they work really, really, really well. And I, the, the timing is really more the factor, I think, that determines success that, as opposed to anything else. I guess what we don't really know is whether there will be any interplay um, between the Im immunosuppressive therapy that a patient had already been on uh, prior to getting sick with COVID-19, um, you know, and whether that's more T cell versus B cell depleting and whether that will make any difference with respect to the efficacy of monoclonal antibodies. My personal opinion is it's probably worth at least uh, considering uh, doing. Uh, I know that in, in, in young patients who look like their recovery potential is otherwise quite good in terms of other comorbidities um, being acknowledged, it's dramatic in terms of its, its impact for improvement. I think the real challenge right now is scarcity of supply. Um, you know, I get an email every two or three hours that's updating me on what's going on at the University Health Network. Um, you know, this is a, a very hot commodity and the market is tight. So we're going to have to be very judicious. We're going to have to be very careful about who we're allocating it to. Um, and frankly, who we think stands to gain the most. I, I don't think this is a therapy that we're going to want to broadly uh, apply to everyone um, whom we don't think has a truly uh, decent recovery potential. But hopefully that is the case for, for a lot of uh, IBD patients. Yeah. And well, I, I think I, I think it was, sorry, Eric, if I just could add just as a, a practical example. So Alberta Health Services in, in, in Alberta um, has approved the use of so trivimab, which is a monoclonal antibody that Abdu uh, is alluding to, and in, is it is approved for individuals in Alberta who are immunocompromised, including patients with inflammatory bowel disease, 
immunocompromised by their by their therapies. Um, and the system that's in place, and this is in Alberta, and it's not necessarily consistent across every province, but it gives you an example of how the logistics organize is that, uh, that you need to get the, the treatment in within five days of testing positive. And the mechanism that Alberta instituted was we have 811, which is Alberta Health Link, that you can, you can call um, and you can let them know, you know that you're um, immunocompromised um, and tested PCR positive or that you're sick in the, and you're immunocompromised, so you'll get a test to be tested within five days, um, PCR positive. And then the EMS will actually come to your house and infuse the antibodies directly into, into, into you. And so we're getting a lot of calls within our patients because many of our patients are, are testing positive right now. Um, and we're fielding that within, within our offices around people who we think are at higher risk and recommending we follow AHS guidance. And, and they're able to, to get the monoclonal antibody in that mechanism. Um, the challenge is province by province. It, the, the administration and the logistics is going to be different. Yeah, that sounds amazing. That's what's happening. I mean, I, yeah, I, that's I mean, not what's uh, happening in Ontario. No, not at all. I mean, that uh, it almost makes me think of, of Tom Louie and, and his uh, fecal microbiota transplant uh, uh, you know, mobile van that he used to take across Calgary and, and bring the therapy to the people. Um, and, and that's fantastic. I mean, that, by principle, that would be ideal is to make sure we minimize the barriers and maximize the potential for recovery, ideally before patients are critically, critically ill um, and in dire straits in an ICU somewhere. I don't envision that happening in Ontario anytime soon, unfortunately. That's a credit to Alberta Health Services, which is a single provincial entity that has a task force that reviewed this, created kind of the bylaws that are kind of cross jurisdictions and then set in, in motion the mechanisms to, to operationalize that. And I, I just want to remind, I think it's important to remind the IBD patients in the audience that for the most part, even though you're immunocompromised, you will do very well if you get COVID-19, if you're young and healthy. Like I think we've been very uh, scary over the last few minutes, but uh, a reminder that all the data that we have in IBD patients are showing that if you're on steroids, you're at risk for severe COVID-19, but otherwise the biologics we use uh, and maybe to a lesser extent the immunomodulators we use uh, like azathioprine are a bit safe, are, are, are safe. And, and people on biologics do not tend to get severe COVID-19 by itself, but you know, I think uh, it's worth the discussion with your doctor if you uh, are looking at the monoclonal antibodies, if it's recommended, I think you should discuss with your doctor as to, to what is your specific case situation. Uh, I wanna just pivot to you, Gil, a little bit, talking about the third dose of the COVID vaccine. And this question is, I think, fairly obvious by now in our conversation, but should IBD patients get their third dose? And then more importantly, you know, what about timing of third dose? There's some questions in the audience about people on prednisone. Should they wait until they're off prednisone to get their third dose? What are you telling your patients? Yeah, no, and, and maybe I can take this opportunity to summarize some of the key points that came out of my, my presentation. And, you know, one of the privileges of being like a scientist and a physician is, you know, you conduct these studies uh, and then you kind of unlock the data and you start to explore it and you start to get surprised by the data that you see. Uh, and one of the things that surprised me was just the fact that a lot of people in our cohort actually didn't get their third dose. And as I mentioned earlier, um, Alberta opened up third dose to IBD patients who are immunocompromised back in August, which was very, very early in terms of, of logistics and, and access. Um, at that time, many of the questions that we were posing now about the fourth dose were coming up a little bit on, on, the, thir on the third dose. Um, but um, people then had access and the ability. And I would say there were 200 people in our cohort that went out and got their third dose and they typically got it in September, October, November, but there was a large group that actually didn't get their third dose. Uh, and because they didn't, when we measured their antibodies in the fall, we could compare the antibodies that they had that were decaying over time as compared to individuals who had the third dose um, and th at the same time, and their antibodies were sky high. And there was a huge delta. And in, including that, we had a subset of people where we, within the same person, we measured their antibody levels after the second dose, and then after the third dose. And again, seeing these huge deltas and these antibodies climbing. Um, one of the things that, that um, Josh Kwan, the master's student did was to build out a model trying to figure out who are the people at risk for having low antibodies 
after the second dose. And we actually discovered a number of things, including drugs and age and things like that. Um, but when we then looked at that model after the third dose, all of those factors went away. They became irrelevant. It was that everyone, everyone who got the third dose um, essentially got a really good and strong response. And the, the big message that that's telling me um, is, is we, we need to get that, that third dose. Um, and this is important because if in my cohort, there was a large subset of people who weren't getting their third dose, these are active people who are engaged in research or you know, connected to a gastroenterologist or referring them into our study and things like that. Imagine the people who are not involved, they're not part of these big academic studies and things like that. I suspect that the actual penetration of a third dose within an IBD population is actually much lower. So I think the big message is we need to let people know that that third dose is critical um, and that they should try to get it um, as, as soon as possible. I mean, most people have gotten their second dose. So by now the third dose is probably months away um, from the second, the second dose. The question about whether you should wait with, with prednisone, um, that's really the only drug that, that came out to kind of say, you know, you actually had a tempered um, antibody response. And so I wouldn't necessarily say that you should shy away from getting the third dose if you're on prednisone. Um, it may be worthwhile to wait till you're under 20 milligrams when the, the dose of prednisone is a little bit um, low because we do see some of the higher risk uh, above the 20. Um, but not to delay getting that third dose too, too long. Uh, and even if you only get a marginal increase in your antibodies because you're on prednisone, maybe this is the population where that fourth dose becomes essential. So that when you know, you've actually recovered, you're now in remission, things are well, you're on a biologic and in, in maintenance therapy and the steroids are off, then, then go and get that fourth dose. But I don't think necessarily think you would have to necessarily delay your third dose, knowing that you do have access to get a fourth dose um, even if you got the, the dose while on prednisone. And if you are delaying on higher dose of prednisone, then, then you should be trying to protect yourself from being exposed by COVID as much as possible. And that includes, I've been mean, giving people disability leaves, um, people who are um, prescribing high dose prednisone because they're flaring. And I'm, I'm, let, I'm writing that they need to be off work and things like that while they're recovering from their flare. And just a reminder of our recommendations that way back in March, 2020, we made them and they absolutely still apply today. Three things that predispose IBD patients to severe COVID-19, and that is being on steroids, high-dose steroids, having moderate to severe active inflammation, and malnu malnutrition. And those three things are in that red part of our triangle, the red part of our risk diagram, that you should be as best as you can staying at home, protecting yourself, not going to work. Uh, and if you have to go to work, because realistically we know, you know there's some people who cannot stay at home and have to work, and you're on steroids, then for sure, get the vaccine, right? And if you've gotten your third dose, get your th fourth dose if you qualify, because you want to maximize the immunity you possibly can, but also wear a mask, wear a KN95 or an N95 mask. Nir, could, we, could I ask you to just kind of summarize kind of the third dose in children um, under the age of 18? What, what are you recommending now? Yeah, so get it, I think is the bottom line, as we've said before. Um, so right now, I mean, we're not at the point of five to 11 year olds getting their third dose, we're at the point of, you know, 12 to 18 year olds qualifying for their third dose, if they're on immunosuppressive medications or five ASA medications, which is pretty much all of our IBD patients, there's very few IBD patients that are not on uh, those medications. And so, yes, your child should get it. And uh, a reminder that for five to 11 year olds, what I'm personally recommending right now is not waiting eight weeks. Uh, maybe I'll ask Abdu about this. We know that the eight week number came from the idea of maximizing immunity and minimizing the risk of myocarditis. Uh, I'm saying not to wait eight weeks anymore because of Omicron being everywhere. So your risk is huge now of catching Omicron and children can get sick. We are seeing kids that are sick at sick kids with COVID-19. Also the risk of long COVID seems still to be in the range of five to 10% in children. So I'm recommending getting it now. Uh, what are your thoughts, Abdu, on that and information about myocarditis risk in the children, the five to 11 year old group? Yeah, I mean, thanks for, for bringing up all of those points. And, um, you know, I have to walk the walk. I've got three kids who, who are all under the age of, of 11. They all happen to be boys, uh, which is why I'm losing most of my hair. Um, but uh, the, the idea here is that the, the factors I think that went into the decision making around four versus eight weeks, for example, and a third dose being necessary or not, I think has been predicated on two main things. One, what the actual risk might be to kids, and two, 
you know, what is the true immune response that kids are going to be able to mount? Is it going to be robust enough to weather the storm? But as we can see, things have dynamically changed with Omicron. I got all three of my kids done at the four week interval uh, because frankly, there's so much Omicron going on uh, right now that I, I think the theoretical risk uh, of an adverse if, event, uh, especially myocarditis, is completely dwarfed by the possibility of, of an infection, whether it happens to be mild and then portend a later risk for long COVID, or unfortunately, maybe rare and complicated, as you say, ending up in sick kids with, with a multi-inflammatory system disorder or, or something like that. In terms of myocarditis, I think we have really uh, at this point in time, accumulated a huge body of data that is enormously reassuring. Um, you know, we started with a fairly small pool that, that, that I think largely emanated out of Israel and then grew uh, exponentially beyond that through huge res registries in, in the CDC and elsewhere. And we've now seen that the likelihood of um, you know, COVID vaccine induced uh, 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 myocarditis is minuscule, first of all, compared to the, the likelihood of the virus induced myocarditis. And we're talking about a handful of cases, you know, comparatively, I think it was something like 15 out of several million cases. And I can tell you from, from the vaccine induced cases that I have personally managed or at least co-managed with cardiology colleagues of mine, um, they're you know, not a piece of cake, but they're relatively simple to manage. Uh, they come into the hospital, they're getting a lot of monitoring with, with EKGs and echocardiograms and cardiac MRs, and they get a short course of anti-inflammatory drugs and they're monitored and truthfully, almost all of them are near perfect within 10 to 14 days. There's no lasting complication. That is not the same situation if you get myocarditis that's due to the virus. The flip side is a 27 year old near Olympic caliber athlete who's in a long COVID clinic two years after having acquired the disease who still can't jog for more than five minutes without being completely winded. That's a reality. So we need to look at things uh, from a perspective of vaccine versus uh, you know, virus induced disease. Um, and now that we know that that risk doesn't seem to exist anywhere near as badly as we want th once thought, I think it makes perfect sense to, to, to go with a shorter schedule uh, at four weeks. Uh, at the very least, it should give us a little bit more peace of mind that if Omicron has peaked, it starts to decline, it'll buy us enough time and keep those neutralizing antibody levels nice and high and sustain us um, until things are much better shape from a community transmission point of view. Great. And one of the questions in the, in the chat box was, do the fourth dose recommendations apply to children as well? Uh, I think for teens, they probably do. I think teenagers, while we say that children are not little adults, teenagers are pretty close to adults and, um, you know, their immune system is strong. I think, again, you need to take into account, you know, other comorbidities that the child may have, how much COVID is out there and how long has it been since the third vaccine. I think for five to 11 year olds, we're going to have more information by the time we get to the fourth vaccine. We're still a few months away of that. Uh, because we've just started administering second vaccines in the five to 11 year olds. So hopefully we'll have more data by the time that, that need for the fourth vaccine. And maybe we'll even have, you know, a booster, a true booster for Omicron, but we'll have to see at that point. All right. Um, just looking down the list of questions, maybe Gil and Abdu, why don't we talk a little bit about breakthrough infections after vaccines? I mean, we're obviously seeing them. And maybe a little bit more about long COVID. I, I remember, Abdu, at the last webinar, you said something that was really encouraging for me and made me very happy that perhaps um, perhaps the vaccines may pre be preventing long COVID as well. Can you speak about those two factors, breakthrough infections and long COVID? Yeah, I mean, breakthrough infections are, are really a, you know, it's a reflection of the fact that A, vaccines aren't perfect, which I think we, we all have recognized at this point in time in the pandemic, but also that the, the variants are different enough from, from one wave to the next. And Omicron has sort of changed that in orders of magnitude we could have never fathomed. When you consider, for example, 19 different mutations that were present in, in the alpha and beta 
era compared to 37 mutations, many of which are in that right spike protein uh, domain area, um, which is really the, the true target for, for vaccines when we talk about Omicron. So, uh, you know, it, it's really a matter of numbers. If you get to a point where there's enough circulating virus and there's enough of ingenuity on the part of a uh, mutation, uh, a, a strain uh, of the virus, a variant uh, that's going to then challenge that, uh, you're going to end up with breakthrough infections. The good news is that we've seen by and large that those uh, who are not particularly uh, heavily immune compromised and have many, many comorbidities and are of an advanced age, you know, it, it tends to be a bit more of the nuisance. And I use that word very, very, um, you know, gingerly uh, because we don't know what that might be uh, later. We hope and we think it probably means a lower risk of long COVID, but we don't know exactly by how much. Um, but by and large, we're talking about people having a bit of a sore throat, maybe a fever and some, some nasal congestion, a cold or a, or a mild flu-like syndrome that is very quick in terms of it um, disappearing within a day or two. Um, you know, for, for sicker patients, for example, I've had patients who have had their, their second vaccine dose were, were actually uh, days uh, within their third vaccine dose. And unfortunately, they didn't have the time to mount, mount the immunity with that third dose. Um, they've ended up in hospital and very sick, but, but those people have multiple uh, organ systems that, that weren't doing well pre-vaccination. So uh, I think that's intuitive. It should give us some hope that um, if we're careful and we try and avoid unnecessary exposure um, and we're getting as many vaccine doses, at least up to three doses um, at, in a timely manner, that we're going to do very, very well overall with respect to uh, these breakthrough infections. Great, thanks. And then I guess the kind of the follow-up question to that is, you've tested positive for COVID. What should you do now in this in this scenario? Um, maybe I do. You want to kind of describe kind of the general things, and maybe I can then add on a little bit of kind of the IBD specific considerations. Yeah, uh, sure. I mean, I, this is a question that's been asked, you know, innumerably, and I think for for good reason because. Uh, I think it's challenged our knowledge, number one, of, of um, you know, the durability of innate antibody responses, the natural response to infection, uh, as well as vaccine-induced immunity and, and how that plays into um, your, your immune status, particularly when you have become sick acutely. Um, when is the right time to do it? Um, you know, I don't want to oversimplify things, but I, I think that in most situations, barring severe immune compromise, we know that most people are going to start mounting some degree of a reasonable immune response within about three weeks. Um, how robust that immune response is obviously going to be enhanced if you are younger, if you have fewer uh, underlying organ system diseases, um, and, and you're less immunosuppressed. You're going to be able to, to mount a, a, a better uh, immune response at around the three-week mark. You'll start mounting that response even at 10 to 14 days. Um, and then exactly how high it goes, again, depends upon all of those other factors as well. Um, so what we've been saying is, is if you have COVID-19 and you're actively infected, number one, we'd like to see those symptoms at least remitting to the point where you're not in this hyper-inflammatory state. Um, things have settled down enough. Um, and that means you may have a lingering cough. You may have lingering symptoms, but if the brunt of the illness has resolved, you sort of look at that as your time uh, N of one, if you will, your, your day of zero, and then give that about three weeks. And then at that point in time, you can probably be considered for getting your first dose uh, of a vaccine. Um, or, or if it hasn't been your first dose, if it's your, your next dose, that's probably the time to do it. You wouldn't recommend doing it any earlier, just because number one, if you're acutely ill and you're still not resolved with that infection, your immune system is effectively occupied, it's saturated, it doesn't have the resources to start building the armamentarium to stand up against the next challenge when you're exposed to the virus. 
that's the first thing. The other thing is that there may be some mix up in the way signals are being generated uh, in general. Um, and uh, you, you don't want that to get in the way, um, you know, we, we would call that immune interference and, and you wanna be free of that and be at a point where your immune system can give its entire focus, if you will, uh, to, to the new challenge and to responding to the vaccine stimulus rather than still dealing with, with the residual infection. And, and then one thing I would just kind of add to that, kind of, there's been a few questions around, you know, I, I just was diagnosed with COVID. What do I do from an IBD perspective, things like that. And, and one of the things I do recommend is to reach out to your gastroenterologist and let them know that you've tested positive for COVID, whether that's with a rapid home antigen test or um, a PCR confirmed molecular test. Um, and ideally try to do that sooner rather than later. And ideally within that five day window of the, of the diagnosis, um, there are a number of practical implications to an IBD patient that the average person who gets COVID uh, doesn't have to consider. And, and the big part of that is, is what to do with your medications. A lot of medications um, are spaced you know, every eight weeks. Um, and so if you happen to get um, COVID right in the middle of that, you just kind of just ride it out. And then you're, um, you, know, you can go to your infusion clinic. But for some people, you might actually be scheduled for your infusion um, if a day or two after you test positive for COVID. And obviously that means you need to delay that infusion, uh, regardless of how you're feeling. Um, and, and then the question is, how long do you delay your medication? So these are really um, important questions that your gastroenterologist can help guide you through, but what to do with your medications if you need to delay them and at what point to restart them. Additionally, as we were talking about earlier, um, there may be some um, treatments that are available for people who are severely immunocompromised within the first five days, the monoclonal antibody, uh, so trivimab and then uh, and eventually Paxlovid. Uh, these are again are, are medications that are given within five days of being diagnosed. And so um, if you're potentially uh, qualified for that or, cons or considering that, that it is something that you want to reach out and try to understand within that, that five days. So I think it is really important now to reach out to your, your healthcare provider and just let them know what's happened so that they can provide any guidance specific to your treatment. Maybe I'll just add uh, quickly, uh, Gil, uh, I know a lot of people still may be confused about the interpretation and um, the optimal use of rapid antigen tests and, and where there may be limitations uh, compared to PCR tests, for example. Uh, and I have to say, I think one of the most poorly represented fallacies out there is that uh, PCR tests are superior all the time. The problem with PCR tests is that while they, they are incredibly sensitive, they are incredibly sensitive, uh, which means that they may actually be picking up dead viral fragments even when you're no longer necessarily symptomatic and when you may not even be um, at risk of transmitting the infection to, to some, somebody else. So that's a, that, that's an important limitation of the PCR test. The really great thing about rapid antigen tests is that they're really engineered, they're designed and intended to not be as sensitive enough to detect being, uh, you know, having an infection at any point in time, but more so to determine when it's going to be at risk, number one, to, to yourself, uh, when, when your viral load is, is higher, and number two, your risk of transmitting to somebody else. And that's really, I think, what's much more important from a practical point of view. So if you are asymptomatic, for example, you're married to someone in your home, you've got uh, a kid at school, or you've got a direct contact with somebody who's become COVID-19 positive, if you're an asymptomatic contact of them, we find that the optimal time to test is at around five days, um, and then to continue testing to, to, towards seven days. But it's the five to seven day period within which you're likely going to become positive um, if you're asymptomatic. Um, and at that point, obviously, you want to seek the guidance of your gastroenterologist, your primary care practitioner, somebody else in terms of what else you should be doing with respect to everything. Um, if you are symptomatic, I think that you want to assume that you've got COVID-19 because right now, if you've got a sore throat, you've got a bad headache with a fever, um, you know, you've, you've suddenly lost your, your sense of smell or taste, uh, it's more likely than not that you've got Omicron as opposed to uh, the average cold or, or flu virus, which truthfully are fairly rare right now. Um, so you should be self-isolating regardless of what your rapid antigen test tells you. Um, and then, 
test after that, um, and, and obviously seek the advice of your your uh, your uh, you know trusted physician contact uh, going forward. Um, but these rapid antigen tests uh, make no mistake if they're used correctly um, and, and they're done properly uh, can be tremendously helpful in terms of guiding your decision making. Um, don't hang your hat on them alone, positive or negative. It always has to be taken into the context of what your symptoms are and what your risk exposure is. So, so that's why it's important to talk to somebody. Great. And I, I, we're coming to the end of the hour and a half now, but I do want to, there's some great questions in the chat that I want to just quickly address if we can. And one of them I think is really important, but difficult for people to grab, to, to wrap their head around. It's, you know, you, you spoke a lot, Abdu, about, you know, the global implication, right? And getting those vaccines to the populations that don't have access to them. What can an individual person do to help that? It's a great question. You know, I, I think we can do a lot and we can do a lot more than, than we think we can um, with our attitude. Um, and you might say, man, that sounds kind of trite. That's pretty lame, but I, I really don't think it is. I think if we change our mindset and we're truly and sincerely committed to understanding that it's the whole camp, you know, it's not our compound, it's the whole camp. And that means the people in every corner of the globe, we have to care about them. And that means we have to care about the essential workers in our community, uh, the people in the more disenfranchised neighborhoods that are harder hit you know until we satisfy the the ability to support them enough to take out that you know uh, 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 you know uh, ember that's going to continue to glow we're not going to get out of this we really aren't and that might mean that perhaps a, a successive waves maybe don't hit us with the same degree of ferocity we're seeing fewer deaths maybe but who knows I mean, I don't think anybody would have imagined when we were seeing the great efficacy of our vaccines in the high 80% to 95, and we were, you know, debating about Pfizer versus Moderna and Pepsi versus Coke, like one was the holy grail and the other was like sloppy seconds, you know, between 94 and 95%. I mean, it seems insane at this point. And then you talk about Omicron when you got two doses and it was 35% efficacy, you know, uh, or 65, 75 with three doses. You know, we have to remember that these goalposts change and they're not changing arbitrarily. They're changing because this virus reflects how committed we are to caring. And I know that sounds trite. So, you know, share that attitude, share it with your kids, share it with your coworkers, write to your MPs, get vocal, you know, participate, every form of advocacy helps. And in the end, it's going to serve us well. We don't want lockdowns. We don't want restrictions. We don't want difficulties that are going to engulf us and, and our children for future generations. But we're inviting that. I think if we treat this as an inconvenience and as a nuisance and as a problem that is domestic, because it's not, it's global. So I don't know what to tell you until we're all out of it. None of us are out of it. And that's the truth. I have to say, Abdu, before you came onto the task force back in June, Gil and I said goodbye to the task force because we predicted this would all be over by now. I say that with a smile on my face, but I'm crying week. inside. Um, I, I'm done predicting what's going to happen with this virus. I think we we have been humbled in the face of nature and and what nature has done to us with this virus. I think it really has taught us that, yes, we have amazing capabilities of human, as human beings, but we know nothing. And the only way we're gonna get through this is by coming together as a community, working together and trying to overcome this. So yes, write to your MP, support, you know, you know, you don't have to support lockdowns, but support public health measures, right? Let them know that you're an IBD patient who's at risk and that you need these public health measures to help you stay safe. And you want to contribute to society and you wanna work and endorse sending money overseas to get those vaccines taken care of. doesn't mean don't get your vaccine, right? Just because you don't get a vaccine here in Canada, it's not going to be sent overseas. You still need to get your vaccine, but we can also do more to protect other countries as well. Yeah, and I just want to piggyback on that just briefly, you know, for, for a little moment of, of reflection. Uh, you know, I, I think the overarching challenge throughout much of this pandemic, and unfortunately, it just continues to intensify as the longer it drags on, 
the more frustration has given way to providing a platform for all kinds of anger, uh, you know, agendas, ideologies that, you know, pull us apart from each other. And I, I think if we don't get away from that, if we don't, you know, really resist the temptation to stop labeling, you know, we've got to stop labeling each other, we've got to stop putting up our flags and saying, I'm this, you're that, we're not going to get out of it. We need to build bridges, not barriers. Uh, we need to avoid confrontations and we got we have to reach out to one another. So anybody who wants to engage you in a fight, move away, you know, find somebody else who's going to grab arms, link arms with you and do something that's better. And, you know, let's kill everybody with kindness, frankly, because we're not going to do any better uh, by uh, making this a, a militant and oppositional war against each other. We have to turn all of those energies against the virus. Sir. You know, when I was younger and I was studying history and you think about different periods in history over the past hundred plus years and events that have happened, most of these like major events, historical events were years. Um, and I think it, when the history books write about this period of time, it's going to be a chunk of time. It's not going to be 12 months or even just 24 months, you know, even be 36 months. Um, and I think we've got to kind of conceptualize this. This will be a historical period of time that we live in. And, and everything that you said, Abdu, is right on. And, and really what how the history is written about this time period is how we treat each other. Um, and, and I hope I hope when my grandchildren are reading about this time period, um, that they can reflect that this was the time that we came together to, ch to talk a challenge. Here, here. So I think that's a great way to end. Uh, and on a positive note, we will all get through this. Pandemics all end. It will happen. Just in the meantime, let's come together, protect yourself, protect your family, protect your friends, protect your community, and we'll get through all of this. So thank you very much, Abdu. And of course, thank you as always, Gil. I think that was a great session uh, and I think uh, provides some very useful information to IBD patients. We will continue to provide this information to you on a regular basis, uh, likely monthly or every two months as information develops. And the task force will, for better or worse, we're here and we're gonna continue to meet and continue to provide recommendations. So please keep an eye on the website, coronacolitis.ca slash COVID-19 for all the latest recommendations and for the week, the uh, monthly webinars. Used to be weekly webinars, but we're down to monthly now. Uh, please let us know what you liked about this webinar and provide your feedback and let us know what you'd like to have covered. It says in future youth events, but in all ages would be appropriate. Uh, there's the information on the websites uh, and a YouTube channel where you can see these webinars arch archived if you missed any of them in the past. Thank you once again to all the frontline healthcare workers and all the frontline workers overall, grocery store workers, taxi drivers, everybody who has to go to work. As I mentioned, some people just don't have the ability to stay home, the luxury to stay home and the safety of staying home. And uh, we are all appreciative of all the work that you do. We've, we've learned very well over the past month, the importance of the supply chain. Those are words that I don't think we ever thought we would use uh, in this century, but we are using it. And I think we've learned that keeping people healthy and keep, keeping these people on the job is by far the most important thing that we can do. And with that, I think there's gonna be a next slide on following on social. And then of course, if you found these webinars useful, if you find them of value, we are once again, still working in a virtual world. We cannot hold in-person fundraising events at Crohn's and Colitis Canada. So please, please, please considering, consider donating to Crohn's and Colitis Canada to help facilitate all the educational events that we provide. Please text CURE to 2222, which will donate $25 automatically, uh, magically. And, or you can go to Crohn'sandColitis.ca and donate uh, through the website. And then the Gutsy Walk is coming up. We're coming on 25 years of the Gutsy Walk and we will be holding it. Uh, I think it's uh, I shouldn't say whether it's going to be a hybrid event or what we're going to be doing, but certainly we're hoping that in June, the Omicron wave will be getting better and we can really get out there outside safely and walk in person. Uh, but we'll, there'll be more information on the Gutsy Walk coming up. So with that, thank you everybody for joining us and we will see you soon. Keep an eye out on the website. We'll be holding more webinars coming forward. Thank you. Take care.